And then you practice that, right? You start figuring out, okay, if I'm leading, this is how I'm leading. This is what it means to lead. And what you discover, whether it's in your own departmental area or company-wide, the bulk of the problems that you're facing in the company aren't strategy or competition or how well do you lead your team? How well do you have your people working together? Welcome, everybody. My name is Haresh Singhani. This is Conversations with Haresh. We'll be talking to people of varied backgrounds, covering various topics. I'm very excited to be able to share these with you. The goal is to increase curiosity and empathy amongst all of us to help us grow professionally and personally at all levels. And of course, we also want to make sure that this is fun. So thank you again, and we'll look forward to having you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of our podcast. Really excited about this conversation. In this podcast, we have Lowell Millard. He started in the technology domain, and then he's successfully transitioned into operations and business. We've known each other for about 10 years. Lowell made the transition or the move out to Eastern Washington, kind of coinciding with the pandemic. And so I'm curious to learn about cultural aspects of that locale and how he's finding success in his business and operations consulting engagements. But without further ado, let's uh, have a chat with Lowell. And again, thank you for joining us. Welcome, Lowell. Happy to be here. As I mentioned, uh, I've been on this project for some time now. We're going to different people, uh, leaders such as yourself, and seeing kind of, you know, how their journeys have been successful and what sometimes didn't work out so well, which <laughs> many of us have maybe more of those uh, battle scars than the trophies. Learning a bit about how you arrived at wherever you are in your journey and then what you're doing now. And we'll look at some successes, lessons, maybe failures, recovery lessons, etc. Towards the end, I want to understand or have you share with the audience how you mixed and created balance between professional and personal in the past, as well as what you're doing now. I understand there are a lot of kids and grandkids in the picture now. So that's, I guess, the blessings for many of us that are fortunate enough at our age. So with that, we'll get started. Towards the end, there's another segment that makes me nervous, which is where you get to ask (laughs) me something. It came out of a couple of conversations where people were like, don't I get to, you know, (laughs) what what do you do? And I was like, I guess that sounds only fair enough. If you want to give us a kind of an introduction to Lowell, Lowell's journey in life, professionally, personally, etc., I think it'll be great to start there. Yeah. So I, I grew up in the Army. My dad, career Army guy. Back then, especially, the Army tended to move people around all the time. I've lived in seven different states. I've been to all 50 states, 13 different schools before I graduated from high school. And so it was just, it was a lot. We lived in Korea, lived in Germany. So yeah, it's it got to see, and a lot of that was really good. I got to see the world and, and a lot of things that I think most people don't get to, to see in their lifetime. And so I feel blessed by that. Eventually kind of settled down in Washington State, went to high school in Olympia, and then ended up going to college up at Western. Then after I graduated, came back and started my career in Seattle. Met my wife, been married to her for almost 35 years now. Three kids, one in the Seattle area, one in Bellingham, and one over here in Spokane. Three grandkids and one more on the way, so we're really enjoying that part of life. 30 of my career years were as an IT guy, maybe a little more than that. It was a good thing. I spent most of that time in the small, medium business market space. Really enjoyed that, but it eventually got to a point where I wanted to I wanted to push myself over into the executive operations, uh, the operations and executive side of the world. And I, <laughs> frankly, I was working with an executive coach at the time, and I re- remember well the phone call with her. I happened to be working for a company that was down in Dallas, and so I was down there when we did the call, and I said, I don't know how we're going to do this, but I'm going to take that IT resume and switch it over to become a, an operations and executive role, and we did. And about six years ago, I, that's the transition I made. Really, really enjoyed that. That's, I think, a, a gifting for, that I have. So about three years ago, I um, got an opportunity to come over here to the Spokane area and help a guy up in northern Idaho sell his company, which we did. It took about six months to get that done. And that was right in the middle of COVID. So that was, 
that was quite a challenge. Everything that you used to traditionally do together, people were suddenly figuring out how to how to do that remotely and get electronic signatures instead of paper signatures. And, and you know, you know how the banks go, and they like their pen and paper. So yeah, that's the transition we made. It's interesting this transition from IT to business. Maybe I don't know how many people attempt it, but many of the ones who do attempt it are not necessarily successful. And they may sometimes revert back to IT because sometimes they already have a brand built you know, there. And then maybe perhaps you can share a little bit about what motivated you to want to do that. Was it that direction you got from the business side was suboptimal? That you were like, okay, this is, you know, whatever I'm being asked to do it won't necessarily solve the root cause of a business problem. Or was it, were there other factors at play? I have always said that a really good IT person probably knows his or her business better than any other individual within the company because they touch it all. And so if they're really good at what they're doing and they're actively engaged, they're not just trying to be a techie, they will understand accounting. They will understand operations. They will understand the sales side. I felt like over my career, I had done that. I, you know, early on when I did my very first ERP system, which was a disaster, (laughs) I quickly realized that I needed to know a lot more about manufacturing. I was working for an aerospace company at the time. So I went out and got a CPIM certification with uh, APEX, which is American Production and Inventory Control Society. I think they've changed their name a little bit now, but that's what they were at the time. All that to say, I got to know the business side very well. And eventually I came to really struggle with the fact that the people I was working for didn't seem to be asking the right questions about business. I ended up going to them with ideas and and I just thought, this is kind of crazy. I need to make this shift because my focus is business. IT was always business for me. It was never about technology. It is the technology, but it's to help you do something. And if you don't know what it is you're trying to do, What's the point? I agree with everything. I've been running high tech advisors for a number of years, and we've known each other, I think, probably for more than 10 years now, or at least close to 10 years, if not more than 10 years. One of the things that we preach and practice, uh, at least we think we do, and hopefully others think we do too, deriving meaning and rewards through your work. And so if something's not meaningful, you're not having fun, or it's just the ratio of misery to fun is in the wrong direction, then you got to figure out what course corrections can you make to get in the right direction. One of the mottos we have is that we map meaningful problems to people who find them meaningful to solve. And it comes from, you know, one of the books by Jim Collins, who wrote Built to Last, Good to Great, etc. But in Built to Last, you get a quote, we're all in search for meaningful work and you can't have meaningful work without search for meaningful life and you can't have meaningful life without meaningful work. And so you're indeed. And so this transition that you're talking about, it's like, okay, so you have this, internal motivation or you identified why some of the problems that you were being asked to work on had underlying issues that were beyond tech, right? And so so you're like, okay, how do I get involved on the business side and then affect or um, influence that? One of the things, coincidentally, and I won't get into that at length here, I, I had a similar transition and externally speaking, even though I was convinced or I really thought I wanted to try the business side, right? But externally speaking, you have this resume, and so I'm curious about the conversation you had with your executive recruiter or the coach. You have this resume where it's like, okay, here's Lowell, a deep expert in all things tech, tech leadership, has five or 15 different companies that, where he created this huge wins, et cetera, et cetera. And then now you're trying to sell yourself to an audience, whether it's one person or a committee of uh, hiring people or whoever it is, and say, I can bring the same you know, energy, et cetera, to a business problem. And then they're like, well, maybe even if you convince them individually, they'll be like, you're politically risky. If I pick somebody such as with your pedigree, da, 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 I don't know. So can you help me sell this internally, right? And so I'm curious how the first set of people that you started going after on the business side, how you sold or convinced them or they convinced themselves. What did you tell them or tell them, or give them in terms of information? This may not lend to my credibility at all, but i tell you the truth of the matter. <laughs> We've all been lucky and people have helped us, so it's okay. okay. The truth of the matter is people aren't quite as picky as maybe they ought to be. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll take myself and you out of the equation for this, but you know, how many times have you seen a CEO at a company and you, and you shake your head and you go, how in the world did they choose that person for that role? And I'm not 
necessarily advocating this to say, don't be genuine, don't be dis, or you know, you shouldn't be disingenuous. The fact of the matter is, if you believe, and I did believe that I had what I needed, it really wasn't hard for me to go in and sell somebody that says, I see these things. And part of that is, I do think I was one of the better IT folks in the community in that I understood the breadth of the business. I'm not an accountant, but I can read a financial, you know, set of financials with anybody, the best of anybody. I understand what they mean. Probably more importantly, I really came to understand what leadership was about. It became a passion of mine somewhere around 2000. And I started reading books like crazy, where you and I met was a big part of that. They had a program, a regional leadership forum, and it was a huge development program for, for that, for me. And then I just never quit. You know, leaders are readers, is the saying. And oh, I'd have to steal that. Oh, yeah. is, you, you have, have at it. It's not my saying. So, <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it's true, right? You know, and whether it's reading or however it is that you've learned. I have one daughter that's auditory, and she'll listen to anything and retain it. You know, I listen to a lot of stuff too, but I like to read. And then you practice that, right? You start figuring out, okay, if I'm leading, this is how I'm leading. This is what it means to lead. And what you discover, whether it's in your own departmental area or company-wide, the bulk of the problems that you're facing in the company aren't strategy or competition or how well do you lead your team? How well do you have your people working together? Patrick Lencioni is you know, famous for this. He said, you know, a group of people all working together in the same direction, pulling on the oars and trying to head in the same place. Lake Blasted story, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. in the 80s? Yeah. Just to quickly summarize, in the IT world, it's about delivering technical solution to the business, right? And, and a lot of tech enablement, whether it's in different functions, HR, finance, customer-facing, CRM, marketing. Once you made this switch over to the business side, now, what is it that you do? And, uh, and maybe how do you help the business owners and businesses with what you're doing right now? I don't think it's a dramatically different thing, right? You know, as a technologist, yeah, it was about the technology, but it was all driven towards some solution, some, you know, meeting a need of some type. And so, you know, if you're implementing an ERP system or a CRM, it wasn't just to put software in. That's the easy part, right? In the old days, we plugged a few disks in the machine and, and voila, we had some software installed. doesn't change anything for you unless you understand what it is you're trying to accomplish. So from that standpoint, leading and, and working in a business. So the two roles that I really took on post-IT, I started out with a company over in the Seattle area, Federal Way, it was a manufacturing company. Initially, when I hired on with the guy, I was facing that struggle you just talked about. <laughs> Tell me you, you can do operations, but I don't know. The way I transitioned into that one was I took over the IT group with the idea that if I did well in that, did what he thought I could do in six months time, I'd go ahead and take over the uh, US based operations. They also had foreign based operations, but I was going to take over the domestic manufacturing operations. And that happened. So that was where that transition occurred. And I still oversaw the IT side of things, but I also then had the U.S. manufacturing side of the house. After that is when I went over and helped this company in Northern Idaho sell. And then they sold, the owner was an out-of-state, was an out-of-state guy. And so he needed somebody in Idaho to run things. So he asked me to stay on. And that will also help with the banks because the banks always want continuity of leadership when there's a transaction. So I did that for two years, also helped them buy another business down in Boise. And I ran both of those from the operations standpoint, Northern Idaho and down in Boise. That's how I made that transition. Transition. Started the this last one as a consultant, helping the previous business owner again because of the continuing involvement in the business side of that. Afforded myself the opportunity to to stay on and run it as president. Are you focusing a little bit more on these businesses or business owners that are looking at points or, or phases of transition, right? Whether it's exiting or merging potentially. That's exactly where my focus is now. I mean, it, and what got me into that was I, over the last year and a half, I've actually tried to buy two different businesses because that is my ambition. My greatest love would be to buy a manufacturing business somewhere here in the Spokane, Coeur d'Alene area because I, I love it. I just, I, I love manufacturing. I love running businesses, but that takes time and it's hard to always find the right piece. And in the process of making, trying to buy these two different companies, I came to realize that the small business owner as a whole really 
really has a hard time with the idea of what it is to sell a business. Where do they even start? They knew how to, they're smart about how they built their business. They understood the technology or the mechanics of what it is they did. But most business owners will sell one business in their lifetime if they're lucky. What I came to realize was they just didn't know how. And so a lot of them fail in that process. So is it like if they're successful 20, 30, 40 year run and then they exit, but they don't harvest any of the residual value? Yeah, 80% of them, in fact, never do sell, which means they just, they have to shut it down and, and liquidate their... Yeah, yeah, it's wound yeah. down. The only thing they got out of their business was what they took out of it along the way, whatever the liquidation value of their assets. Right, the so-called building equity didn't, didn't really happen, happen that's right? right. And part of that is, a big part of that is just there's a process that you go through to be successful in selling, and they don't know what it is, and they don't know who to turn to to do that. Um, and it depends on the size, right? If you're a $100 million company, you're going to have lots of people trying to help you sell that business because the, the investment bank community will jump into that because they, there's a lot of money in, in those transactions for them. Lots of fees. Yep. So they're eager and there's good advisors in that space. In the small business community, say under 20 million, especially under 10 million, not much because they just don't look at it as being worth enough to them to do much in that space. So these poor folks are just underrepresented in a bad way. They might get hooked up with a business broker, somebody who will say, yeah, I'll put you up on biz buy sell, which is a not quite like MLS for... <laughs> But it's a it's a it's a transaction site. It's a you know um, an eBay for for businesses. Go on and see what's listed, and I go on there, but I don't find much that I really find interesting. Maybe I'm not using it well enough, but that's what they get. Well, there's so much more that they need than that. So much more to prepare them. You've had a lot of real estate background, and you know, so people think of selling a business kind of like selling real estate. You know, you tidy up the yard, you give it curb appeal, you you know, maybe slap a fresh coat of paint on it or whatever, you know, three months later, you're, you're ready to market your house. Well, that isn't the same for a business. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually, as they say, right, in real estate, location, 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 and in business, there's no location. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> there's so much, businesses have so many variables. I think real estate has several variables that are core and that are fixed from building to building, house to house, etc. Maybe that's why People struggle a little bit more with valuing businesses, how to find buyers or how to kind of make the right buyers aware, right? Because not all buyers are going to be interested in all businesses. Unlike houses, every house is going to, there's only one use. It gets lived in. Do you have, maybe this can be a, a second topic or something. If you have like a framework or uh, some kind of an analysis, a methodology or something that you use to help businesses that Maybe some of the people in the audience, if they're interested, uh, they, they can find. Do, 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 do you have a website? I do have a website. It's not very, <laughs> not very robust at this point. There is a set of frameworks available. And honestly, this is one of those places where without sounding too much like a salesperson, people need a coach in this. This is not one of those ones where you can go out and uh, just say, oh, I can pull this down off the web and change X, Y, and Z. Answering your question, though, there are frameworks to use. And I think that's the key for people is there's so many decisions and questions and things that need to get answered. For the most part, unless you have, unless you meet somebody who can help you go through those frameworks kind of identify the lanes and the values and the things you're trying to get, you'll get hit with question after question and not have a meaningful way to answer those questions. And that's where I try to play in that space. Excellent. Perhaps the last part, unless there's anything else you want to cover in, in this, how are you finding people to work with, clients, etc.? I'm sure having been around, there are a lot of people you know, it's word of mouth is probably a big factor, but it's a lot of networking, getting in front of the right people. In my case, probably the best referral partners are going to be the CPAs. CPAs tend to be the most trusted advisor of a small business. They're the ones who have most frequent contact with small business owner. The other ones are obviously business brokers, and sometimes the bankers and the attorneys will get in there as well. So trying to build in those four niches trying to build connections and make awareness of this. And frankly, again, for a lot of these, you know, for the CPAs and the, and especially for the brokers, I, I don't know if I said this, but 
of the businesses who want to sell don't, which means only 20% do. If you're a business broker, <laughs> that's not, I mean, the business owner, that's bad odds for the business owner, but it's really bad for the business broker because they only get paid if they sell something, right? So, uh, so if, I, yeah, if I can help them, yeah, if I can help them figure out how to take that number from maybe 20% to even 40%, that's good. And not only that, but also increasing then the, the value of the sale. Because that's where a lot of people leave just a ton of money on the table. They don't, you know, if they don't know how to dress this thing up, instead of getting $2 million, they might get, you know, a million dollars or a million and a half. Well, that's a lot of money to leave on the table. Yeah, it's, it's it, for, I think, kind of advisory type of services, word of mouth for, you know, kind of smaller teams. I'm assuming you're a smaller team. You might have some helpers coming in here and there, but mostly it's an army of one. The word of mouth mechanism is still a good one as far as finding prospects, et cetera. And it's not just about discovering that, okay, Lowell or Haresh or somebody else is doing this type of work. It's also about transitioning or transferring the credibility, which comes through word of mouth. So I have one other uh, section in the, in the kind of what you're doing, but also it kind of ties to some of your past work, uh, which is any um, leadership principles and tenants, right? Are there like, one, two, or three obvious or golden rules or rules of thumb that you have that you use now and then you encourage other people to potentially use as well. As I kind of alluded to earlier, the people side of things is really the heart of it. Who's on your team and having good people on your team, getting the wrong people off your team, making sure everybody's in their right role. That's classic Jim Collins, right? You know, good to great. Right people on the bus, wrong people off the bus, right seats. Um, Speaking of that, I, I do have, a, I guess, a I want to slice that a little bit. Right now, especially in the tech domain, but it's happening in other domains as well, there's a lot of reduction in force happening. Any techniques that are more respectful, more humane, and, and maybe even longer term, more productive when it comes to getting people off the bus that are not a good fit? Yeah, I mean, honesty is where you have to be at. And humane treatment of people. In my career, I have not shied away from letting people go. But I've always tried to do it with the right, A, being very honest with them and treating them with dignity on the way out the door. And what that really boils down to, how do you treat somebody if you have to let them go? Tells everybody else how you will treat them, those who remain. So those who are left behind are the ones who you really need to focus on. But if you trash somebody on the way out the door, you shattered your credibility with the people who remain. And they're the ones who are going to help you get the work done. You have to really treat those folks right, whether that's, and it depends on what it's for, right? If it's a termination for cause because they really screwed up, well, they're not going to get a, a monster severance payment. And even, But even then, you can do it in a way that doesn't. I mean, if they screwed up, they screwed up and probably everybody knows it. Enough, enough said. You don't have to, you know, go in and I always say that America's, the favorite sport of American business is to shoot the dead. Um, and, they, and keep shooting until you run out of ammo. <laughs> and it's like, no, you know, they're gone. You know, give them some dignity and that'll build credibility with whoever's left behind. Those are good points. In a way, the empathy factor can work against you if you're not mind to make it twist around the axle too much. But you do have to be firm and humane, respectful, and then honest. I think honesty, transparency is, is really key if I'm kind of understanding some of the things that you're saying. We alluded to this a little bit earlier, which is kind of the battle scars or failures and recovery, et cetera, right? So maybe an anecdote or two when you were, you know, where you had a setback, right? Whether it was a combination of personal and professional or, or, or at a business level, team level, et cetera. And then kind of that one came out in the end. And then also in general, any techniques and lessons around fault tolerance, if you want to call it, right, in one's self and one's life. <laughs> failure, failure tolerance, really. I mentioned earlier that I, I did an ERP system that didn't go so well. It was the very first one I'd ever done. I was working for a manufacturing company in, in aerospace. We did need a new system. I didn't know enough to know what I didn't know. And we had a sales guy who sold us a good system, but not a good implementation process. He was basically treating it as, I'm going to get the software in, I'm going to transfer the data, and then 
you're on your own. And I quickly realized just scratching the surface, that's just the starting point. So I failed badly at that one. I mean, if you if you want to come right down to it, that implementation went horribly. Purchasing manager came to me three, four months after we had it on, and she just said, this is a disaster. And my first reaction was mm -hmm. very, very defensive. <laughs> I just thought, well, it's not my fault, blah, blah. And then I started to realize, you know what, <laughs> Julie, you're right. This is a disaster. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about it? I think one of the keys to overcoming failure is the ability to be honest and accept it and be honest with everybody else. So there's a humility that comes with just saying, yeah, that was me. I screwed up. What do we do to fix this? And we did that. And she then became my partner in the process of recovery rather than my enemy. That has played out time and time again in my career. Those who are willing to do that, I think in the end succeed. Those who can't do that, people don't trust you. They know you've screwed mm -hmm. up. You know, you know you've screwed up. And if you can't say it, then they won't trust you anymore. That's a huge part of uh, getting back on that. And then in terms of, you know, how do you handle it internally for yourself? I have a quote that hangs on my wall. It's Teddy Roosevelt's The Man in the Arena quote. Some, a lot of people know it because it's, it's fairly famous. But he basically says it's not the guy who's out there and getting bloody and dusty and and all, or it's not the critic who counts. That's, that's this famous line. It's not the critic who counts. It's the guy who's out there actually trying and doing everything he can. He fails and gets up and tries again. That's been a huge thing. If you don't know that quote, I encourage you to look it up. It's Absolutely. inspiring to me. Uh, Winston Churchill, right? Never give up. You know, never, never, never give up. Keep getting up as long as you keep getting up. <laughs> I'd be old politicians. So, yeah, yeah, old school politicians. That's the key, right? <laughs> <laughs> Those are some great suggestions. I think transparency is key. Defensiveness obviously is not good. It doesn't help build credibility because it sometimes hinders your progress from getting down to the root of the issue and then doing better the next time, right? And all of us have had so many battle scars. And when, as you were talking about the CRP implementation, it reminded me of a project 20 odd years ago we did for Boeing and it involved their supply chain. And we essentially broke their ability to send orders to their suppliers, which is a slight issue. That's a manual. <laughs> <laughs> to their credit, one of the nice things that I've discovered in working with these enterprises such as Boeing, we've done work with another company that has over a hundred year history called Nintendo. The nice thing about these companies is that they're like, we've been around long enough. We know that screw ups can happen, right? <laughs> and they're like, you know, we've seen a few other things like a couple of world wars, several depression and depression-like events, right? The one thing I learned and we've learned in general is that there's actually more forgiveness than we might give other people credit for, especially when you're earlier, right? Once you kind of understand and accept that as much as, as hard as everybody tries, including your team, et cetera, you, you're just never going to get it right 100% of the time. And then the damage that you might suffer is can vary. In some cases, it'll be bigger. In some cases, it'll be lesser. But it's just really sometimes as the cliche saying goes, right? It's, it's what happens after the crisis that counts a lot more than kind of even the things that led you, led you to the crisis, right? And so, so it looks like we might share some similar philosophies there. So I'm going to go into kind of like how you're balancing all factors to create a rewarding experience as a person, as a family person, as a community member, et cetera, and balance work and hobbies and family and health and so on. So I understand, you know, from our prior conversations and also in this one, that family is a big component of where you are in life today. And so anything as far as things that have worked for you and how to stay grounded and connected to things beyond work, because I think we haven't necessarily talked about this before, but I don't see you as somebody putting business at the top of life. Yeah, it, it, and it, well, and, and that's, um, I'm kind of mixed on that. <laughs> All right, not, not at least at the exclusion right. of other things. And, and that's probably the, the key thing is I love business, to be honest. I just, I, sometimes when people ask me what my hobby is, I'm tended to, you know, to, I tend to tell them, well, I just really enjoy the business side of things. If I have a good working situation, that, that's as satisfying to me as, as any hobby I might do. I have a few hobbies and things that I do on the side, but, you know, nothing that's really consistent or, or long term. I'm not a huge golfer or anything like that that some people do. But uh, 
In terms of the family, look, I wish I had done better when my kids were younger. I look back now and think that there were plenty of times when I probably should have been a little bit more attentive. You know, I made those choices. I was there. I was at the kids' games and whatnot. And, and now, of course, it's shifting into the grandparenting side of it, which is very fun and highly recommended. Putting that time into those kids now and it's fun to watch them. They're young. The oldest one has just turned two, and it's just been a delight to see her develop, be part of that process with them. I think in terms of my balance, over the last 10 years, I've really tried to, I've never been much of a health person, but I did about 10 years ago, really try to start getting into exercising. And, and I've been fairly consistent with that over that time. So in the morning, I tried to get up. Now I had so shoulder surgery about three months ago, and <laughs> that's been kicking my tail in terms of my habits. But so I like to get up and exercise and, and in the morning have a time between exercise and, and reading. I like to spend some time reading my Bible, praying, and that's my grounding time. That's what I do. Is it accurate to say you're a gun <laughs> Uh Yeah, a little bit. Uh, the two companies I ran here in, in, in Idaho were both firearms companies. I'm not a nut about it. I have, you know, probably more than the average person, but I, I know plenty of people who have, have that habit of bug a lot worse than I do. Yeah. I mean, it's ironic. I, I've, I, I'm i not a gun owner. I'm fairly neutral, I guess. On I mean, I think our policies are gravely screwed up, but guns in general are not necessarily good or bad. Uh, for whatever reason, a lot of friends are gun enthusiasts. I don't ask them that question before making them friends. <laughs> but, uh, but it just so happens. And uh, for me, I, it personally, like being absent-minded, I think is not a good mix to be a, I probably wouldn't be a good pilot, right? <laughs> right? And so there are certain things I'm like, okay, from what I know about myself and, and kind of the, the gaps that could be super critical. No, it, it's fun, but it is definitely a responsibility. You know, at one point I certified as an instructor, mainly for handguns. That was always one of the lessons, parts of the lessons that I had for people is, look, it's, it's a right and it's a responsibility. You as the owner of that firearm are responsible to make sure that it's properly used, properly stored. If it ever happened that one of my firearms got into the wrong hands, I would be devastated. And then you mentioned faith as well as being part of your overall part of your life, I suppose. Has that varied over time? in terms of your, maybe the value or the engagement? Probably, yeah, in all honesty, over the years has ebbed and flowed a little bit. And I think that's, just, again, being the honest side, I'd, I'd love to tell you I was Mother Teresa, but I'm not. Well, it wouldn't mix with honest. It wouldn't mix with honest, yeah. 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 <laughs> the, the beard probably gives me away on that, but. Uh, no, yeah, I think it has. And there have been times when it has been just huge. And, and through some of the trials that have come along, that's probably where it has been most significant. I will say that when I have been dialed in that way, which is really you know me making the right choices, it has prepared me and helped me move through those challenges in a way that I wouldn't have done so easily otherwise. Yeah, I think that covers it. I just have one of the questions I mentioned that we might cover is kind of your current reading list. And I, I see some of the titles you had sent over. Maybe you can give us a quick overview of what you're reading. And do you do audiobooks? I do. I love my paper books. You see a little bit of my bookshelf behind me. I've got two of them uh, fairly full. The problem with my paper books is it's hard for me to get time to read. So when, when I exercise in the morning, so I tend to try to get them on Kindle and read while I'm working out. That way I can dual purpose that time. And if I like a book, I'll go ahead and buy the paper version of it as well. Just because I'm visual, it helps me to see my highlights and I can get the context a little easier than I can in, a, in an electronic book. But I think I've gotten pretty adept at reading electronically. I'm working through Extreme Ownership is the book I'm, I'm reading at the moment. Patrick Lencioni is one of my favorite authors. He just came out with a book called Six Types of Working Genius. Finally, Late in my career, read the book Getting Things Done by David Allen. Highly recommend it to anybody who needs help with their productivity. Walking to Destiny. I just went through a certification program to become a certified exit planning advisor. Walking to Destiny was one of those books that was part of that program. And then It's a Journey is another business transition related book that I just read. So, yeah. What are you reading? <laughs> I'll come to that in a second. While we're on the subject of what you're reading, you had told me, I think in our last 
meeting. Buy then build. Buy then build. That's right. That's right. That's an interesting title, and I I haven't gotten to it yet, but I like the premise, right? Because actually, a lot of the people I've talked to on this podcast so far have been from scratch builders, right? Entrepreneur types. Of course, nothing comes from nothing. They started somewhere. They got a lot of experience and teachings and financial help, et cetera, to, to create the savings to enable them to potentially start companies from scratch. But I think this buy then build is a good concept because it's like many things in life. It can be more convenient and rewarding and practical to build on other people's success right? Opposed to necessarily wanting to roll up everything from yourself from scratch, which entails a whole different set of variables, which some people might enjoy and have the luxury to pursue. Well, and I think there's a few people who are really good at that. A few people, but I think most of us aren't. My hat's off to anybody who can start a business from scratch. The whole premise of that model is somebody's built this. And this is true of most small business owners. They can get it to a certain point because They know how the mechanics of the business work, either because they were, take a heating and air conditioning company, right? Guy probably started as a technician. He either was a sheet metal guy or he was a refrigeration technician or something like that. I can run my own business. So he starts it and he gets it to a certain point, but then to get it from there forward, that's a whole nother skill set that he may or may not have. And most don't tend to develop. So they reach that plateau and the best option they might have is to sell it to somebody else who can then come in because that person isn't necessarily a refrigeration technician, but they are a business person. They can take the principles of business and lift that business from where it's at to another level. This is a great point. In the earlier parts, whenever we started talking about kind of what you're focused on, it was about helping the operators or current owners harvest more value or realize more value from their 20, 30, 40, 50 years of work. But what you're talking about now is the buy side. What is the value they're getting, right? Which, what is the value of a running business when you acquire, you come into it and you could be a previous business or a business operator, right? It's very possible. But, you know, there are people that are 50, 60, and they have still a lot of time left. And for whatever reason, they're at a phase in life where they're not continuing to do whatever they happen to be doing for the first, you know, 20, 30 years of their career. And maybe that's a good time to just buy then build, right? That may be an operation strategy for that part of their career or this part of their life, right? From 50 to 70 or 50 to 60 to 75, whatever it may be. So you're saying that not only are transactions good for sellers if they can harvest more value out of their life's effort. But you're saying the buyers will be better off because they're not forced to start from scratch if they can actually buy the right businesses. And then it sounds like there are these a whole bunch of techniques and tools and experts such as yourself who are there to help them actually build on top of whatever they acquire. Right. Walker Debo, who wrote that book, calls them acquisition entrepreneurs. You have to have enough of the skill set of being a a business builder to do that successfully. And I truly believe that's something I can do because I did do it in the two businesses we bought here in in Idaho. I didn't buy them. I did it for the previous owner. So he actually succeeded in that strategy through me uh, because that's what I did. We doubled the revenue of one. We took the other one, which was almost insolvent. And brought it back to financial health and grew it about 40% in the year and a half that I had it. And a lot of that is goes back to the people side of things that we talked about earlier. And there's ways to do that. But in the process of doing that, the value creation that happened for that buyer who bought those two businesses was enormous, both in terms of revenue growth and resulting cash that came out of that. It was millions of dollars in cash that came out of that, more than paid for his investment and then some. Some great points on multiple fronts that we've mm-hmm. covered that you've been generous to share. I know it's my time to be uh, <laughs> on the spot, but you asked the question around what mm-hmm. am I reading? Uh, it so happened last summer, my daughter was doing an internship in Manhattan, mm-hmm. and then I happened to visit her for about a week. And then I ended up getting curious mm-hmm. about all things New York. I came across, during last fall, I came across this author named Robert Carroll, who had written a book about a gentleman named Bob Moses, who was a essentially a local dictator in New York City for over four and a half decades. 
the book that Robert Carroll wrote, which was published in 1974, called The Power Broker, mm -hmm. Bob Moses and the Fall of New York. Okay. And so that was, it was a long yeah. book, man, I was tired. <laughs> I did that. And then now I kind of have, I'm going down, what else has that author mm -hmm. written? So that author's subject happens to be political okay. power. But the next subject that Robert Carroll attacked, national level political mm -hmm. power, the case study he happens to have picked is Lyndon Baines okay. Johnson. The author is, I think, 87 or 88 years old. He started on this project 49 okay. years ago. He's still at it, 40, so four volumes done. Mm -hmm. wow. He's working on the fifth wow. one. He and his editor is like 91. Okay. It's, a, it's a fascinating story. Uh, they actually have a documentary out called Turn Every mm -hmm. Page. It's really, really interesting. Political power. Mm -hmm. so, so I started on LBJ. Unfortunately, that journey is almost 4,000 oh. pages before you went yeah. to fifth volume comes out. So this is very masochist <laughs> exercise. <in some ways. laughs> oh, you. One of the things I, I've seen is there are parallels. And now, actually, in the current happenings, right, AI is mm -hmm. everywhere. And you and I are old enough where dot-com was right. everywhere. And, you know, Y2K was mm -hmm. everywhere. Cloud mm -hmm. was everywhere. Mobile was everywhere. Cybersecurity was right. everywhere. And then each one of them, as experienced, as we are, we didn't see the industrial revolution from the beginning. Right, right? not quite that far back. Right? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but but we've seen these paradigm shifts, right? For potentially how we put it. So what happens is the technologies and kind of the current tool sets keep changing, vocabulary keeps changing, but the human condition doesn't change. Whatever was true in you know 1800s and whenever some of these books are covering is very much true when it comes to how do you influence people, how do you obtain power and use power in scenarios where you know you have a blue ocean opportunity where you can grow the market, but also in scenarios where there's a zero sum opportunity, which is like politics, right? Because you can't, you can't have two bosses, right? In politics, there's always, always one, and so. So I'm reading about some of that. I also read The History of Modern Finance by Ron Chernow, which was through the lens of the Morgan family. It's very interesting. There's an author named Neil Shubin, I think. He wrote a book called Your Inner Fish. At one point, he was a professor in some university. So he was a paleontologist, and then uh, he was teaching, happily teaching away or whatever. And then one day, the dean of medicine calls him and says, you are now our anatomy professor. Human anatomy, right? <laughs> there was a little bit of a kind of a backstory. The, obviously, the dean of medicine had really high confidence in this gentleman, Neil Shubin. Some of these people are like machines. You give them anything. Anything on the other side is nicely packaged, highly presentable, sorted, comes out, right? It could be anything. It doesn't matter. And so, so in some ways, Neil was like that in the eyes of that dean. And then they say, okay, why don't you teach anatomy? Because our anatomy professor has quit. And so Neil, he just goes in, right? And tries to discover, learn everything about the field so that he can teach uh, the medical school students human anatomy. But because he was a paleontologist, he wanted to understand not only what is the anatomy of the human heart, what is the anatomy of our ears and eyes and all body parts, right? But he wanted to understand evolutionarily how it came about. And then he put that into his courses. He wrote this book, which is for lay people. It's not a technical book called Your Inner Fish. In that, he gives human anatomy and he gives a history of each of our major parts in the anatomy. For the medical students, it actually gave them a better understanding of why certain diseases are experienced by humans in certain body parts. So, for example, one, this is a very simplistic example, but because we used to be on all fours, and at some point we started standing up and walking, standing up on twos, your GI tract now has different strains and stresses than when you used to be on all fours. Hernia-like or hernia-causing conditions are because of the way we evolved, right? And so so then when I studied this book or read this book some time ago, I started thinking about everything like that. So now I want to see, like, okay, if, if our political system is like this, how did it come out about? And at national level, it's pretty well known because everybody is forced to study like history, national history. But sometimes we don't know this at the local level and sometimes we don't know this at the domain level. So for example, if you take information technology, if you take M&A and the business side, there's certain practices that are followed, but it wasn't always that way. Things evolved to that point, but it's like, okay, how did you get there? 
it's kind of like when you're trying to understand geography of the Cascade Mountains or Seattle area and the Puget Sound. So you're like, okay, these are the things, but how did it happen? Because then that'll give you potentially a clue into what the future can hold and how you can maybe influence or tweak it and so on. So this is a very... It's high uh, level. I mean, it, but it's it's going into what gets you, what, what got you to this point and how did that, how did that, how did that come about? One of the things that was interesting, and when I read about the power broker Robert Moses in the in the uh, fall of New York, was if you ask most Americans that are well educated or well read or well versed in the American history, national stuff. But if you ask people at a local level, not even the state, but at a local level, the city council, city manager, city or a mayoral city mayoral system. And then the entire governance and bureaucracy of civil service at the local level, how that was designed, how it came into being. Most people who are even good at history won't be able to tell you. But that actually is what affects most of our lives, right? Because where you can build what is determined by the local zoning laws, right? (laughs) So in that book, there's actually a history of how many of the local institutions came into being in different governments, but starting in New York City, which was, for better or for worse, was a pioneering. A lot of the local government models are based off of New York in the States, right? And so, but uh, all this ties, ties into one of the things that I'm doing this week, which is I'm moderating a panel on artificial intelligence. And that is forcing us to ask many existential questions very broad questions, right? Who are we? What is our future? But what are the machines going to do? And how are you going to keep them in check and so on? And so that's kind of been preoccupying my time. So rather than reading last probably four, six weeks, I've spent a lot of time also watching YouTubes and listening to Jeffrey Hinton and Bill Gates and Eric Schmidt and Sal Khan and Elon Musk and all these people. There's a and lot of like, varied opinions coming out on that right now, I think. Um, you got Yeah, there, there definitely are. But I think there is a framework that is rather productive. It doesn't take that much effort to get handled on the core issues. No matter what your domain is, uh, we should all be paying attention to this uh, to some extent. So I'm kind of curious on this one because I've kind of gone back and forth and I'm having been a technologist most of my life. I'm generally speaking in favor of it. For years when robotics came out, they were worried that that was going to put everybody out of business and we're not going to have anything to do and no meaning in life. And But, you know, we've obviously seen that that was not the case. The, the assembly line improved things, everything all the way up through, took some of the drudgery out of that. This feels like a really different piece, which kind of makes me sound like like I'm flipping on myself now. But I'm wondering a little bit about AI because always before, it always required us to be the driver of the technology. And we're seeing an AI where it's almost becoming it, gaining an ability to drive itself. Where do you think that's going in a good way? And where do you think that's going that might potentially scare the living daylights out of you? Many, many people and much bigger and deeper and relevant experts are looking at this question that you just asked, right? And I happen to just be scratching the surface of this. But from what I learned, there's a lot of unknowns. Not only I don't know, nobody knows the answers, right? So where is it going? Nobody really knows. But there are some things that are like knowns. So one is ability of AI machines to become intelligent or or to learn is much, much better and quicker and faster than people thought even two years ago. So the pace is accelerating and they don't expect it to slow down. Which makes it a little different than our previous technology. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Another thing that is there, which when you look at some of the interviews with like Jeff Hinton, who named sometimes the father of modern AI, this uh, engineering fellow that quit Google last week, I think, so that he could speak more freely. He He was speaking freely before anyway. But the, one of the reasons he said he quit was not so that because Google was censoring what he was saying. People don't attribute what he's saying to Google. And I'll send you a link. Actually, he did an interview. He did many, many interviews. And I actually listened to his interviews at different news outlets. But the best one I found was for me was this interview he did with the MIT Technology Review magazine. He did it in a conference setting, but he came in via video. There's several things that are they're going on. There's something called back propagation. Which, which is what's creating this rapid learning in the machine. And because the ability to learn is so high, a human brain has about 100 trillion neurological connections or neurons. The best machines we have today have 
about a trillion in nodes and elements. They're learning certain things really, really quickly and better than we are because they're able to learn faster, potentially using this thing called back propagation, which is there's several researchers, including Hinton, came up with in the 70s. So that's one thing. It can learn very fast. The second thing is, imagine two humans. You've learned a bunch of things, and I've learned a bunch of things. Now, your job is to teach me what you've learned. If it took you 10 years to learn something, it might take you five minutes to explain to me. And I'm doing an extreme example, right? And then similarly, vice versa. But it'll be an imperfect, leaky process. And then there's a limit as to how many humans you can reach and then teach them everything you know. So knowledge will always be like fragmented. The human intelligence was always fragmented, right? There was no way for one human to teach every other human everything that was in this brain. That's not the limit in AI. Every brain, every AI brain, whatever it learns, it can instantly share with every other AI brain. So this is the capability. Of course, this can have very, you know, many, many positive uses. One of them is that, for example, which I'm really excited about, is that every kid and every person can have an individual tutor now. You know, that student to teacher ratio, just content purposes, it's one on one. So I think that could be very positive. But the one thing that isn't there yet, but they think that it will be, and that's going to be the really scary factor, which is can the machine create goals for itself, right? That's when you have Terminator and runaway machines. And there are those people, Elon and Gates and others signed that proclamation or whatever it was. Well, let's put a pause on AI, which is not realistic. So they don't really mean that. I think what they mean is that they're trying to create track attention to the problem so that hopefully the policymakers of the world can maybe do something, right? So Jeff Hinton, one of the things he mentions is that think of this as analogous to nuclear weapons or international law on war crimes, these global issues or frameworks that came into being. And so people started cooperating, right? So the nuclear non-proliferation the globe cooperated, right? Because it was a common enemy. The United Nations, which gave, for better or for worse, some means of governance at the global level, right? And then you have the monetary stuff, IMF and World Bank and so on. But it was because those were set up to tackle issues that cross all the borders, at least in theory, even if they're very, very imperfect institutions. So we have something similar. He's saying that we're facing, and then a lot of people are saying, the threat is massive. And so the cooperation that's needed is going to need to be global, obviously. So that's just geographically, but it also has to be global from, in the sense it has to be from every domain and then every sector, whether nonprofit, for-profit, governmental, and on you go. So this is going to affect you. We can pretend, if I'm a person in XYZ domain, I can pretend to keep my head in the sand. It's not going to work. It's an interesting, very, very interesting time to be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the good sides are really fun, right? You know, you're typing along in now look now and it starts to finish your sentence for you. And sometimes that's, you know, exactly what you're going to say and you hit tab and you can type twice as fast. The flip side scares me about the the capability to be deceptive now is going to be much more enhanced. And I don't know where that goes. Nobody, unfortunately, nobody does. And concepts that we've taken for granted for a long time or concepts that we thought were black or white or at least more black or white are much less so. Privacy, copyright, semantics, right? Learning, intelligence, sentience, all these words have been thrown around for a long time, but we weren't forced to think about the deeper meaning of those. No, because we kind of all have had a much higher level of control than is place with what we're doing today. This particular rendition of technology has more life in it independently than we have had in our past. I mean, always before, we talked about an ERP system, right? The ERP system did what you told it to do. There's no magic in software. If you tell it the right stuff, it does the right stuff. If you tell it the wrong stuff, it does the wrong stuff. But it was always you or I who set that up right and controlled it. This feels like it's got a little bit more of a, you know, you point it in a direction and say, got it, I'm on it, I'm out of here, go take a nap and I'll handle it from here. It's definitely, we're going to have much less control than we think. If our expectations are so low, right, or so negative, if you will, maybe hopefully we can be surprised on the positive side. So it's not going to be as bad as we think. Well, the positive side that I'm excited about, right? It is good. I mean, I see, I see the benefits of that really nice. I mean, you know, you can find things, information that didn't, you had a difficult time unearthing before. 
it's not profit now. That's a fantastic thing. But there's a lot of upside. I'm excited about that, and I'm not worried about that. I'm just worried about about the downside pieces of it. I think another thing I think that may be creating more pessimism also about this or more fear is that until the machines were just threatening muscle, but not truly our brains or people who are knowledge workers, what happened was there was a, a little bit of a distance, a degree of separation. The people who have the microphones and now the cameras like you and me, we used to talk about displacement of manufacturing labor or manual labor in a third person sense. Now this, you're talking about displacement in a first person reference. And so that means the people with microphones are amplifying the fear because they're like, this is coming after me. It's not just coming after my cousin and my you know, sister or my friend who's working in the mines or who's working in manufacturing plants in the Midwest or Inland Empire like Spokane. This is coming after me. And so now I'm going to freak out more personally, but I'm also going to say it more on, with the microphone, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, so there's this, I think there's a slight coincidental amplification going on. This is going to change things for sure. And one of the things I was talking with an executive who happens to be a friend and he, he happens to be at Starbucks yesterday because his kid is looking at colleges. So one of the things we were talking about was programming computer science, software engineering. Should I even bother going into that? If I don't bother, what do I bother with? <laughs> I think that is one of the most, I mean, I said this a long time ago when I was probably back in the early 2000s, I had a bunch of sysadmin type people and I said, man, you got to up your game because we got cloud is coming and we're not going to be sitting on a stack of servers in our computer room. If that's your stated goal in life is to be a sysadmin for a private company. You better think that one over again. Well, it's kind of the same thing now if for the computer programmer because the dang things are writing code faster and better than, than a human can. And you and I being the techies that we've been all our lives, you know, you understand that the term technical debt, if an AI program is good, it's not going to write technical debt, you know, because it's got that ability to have the, the snaps of synaptic connections. It knows, you know, that if I if I write this here, it's got to tie to that there. And you don't have these disconnects that happen when, you know, when a team of humans are writing it. As good as they might be, they're still going to forget about what Bob did on the other side of the room in his section of the code. So it's been uh, wonderful. And we can continue after we pause the, the recording here. But any final thoughts? You know, it, we talked about some of the craziness in the end. I, I still come back to the, the people matter the most. And no matter what goes on in, in all of these things that we're talking about, if that focus remains for you, for us, we will, generally speaking, make the right decisions, do the right things. If we take our eyes off of that and focus on other things, you, you lose that. And so people matter. That's what we got to focus on. With that happy thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lowell. You Good talking to you, Absolutely. as always. Thank you. Thanks for the talking. invite. To learn is much, much better and quicker and faster than people thought even two years ago. So the pace is accelerating, and they don't expect it to slow down. Which makes it a little different than our previous technology. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Another thing that is there, which when you look at some of the interviews with like Jeff Hinton, who named sometimes the father of modern AI, this uh, engineering fellow that quit Google last week, I think, so that he could speak more freely. He was he was speaking freely before anyway, but the, one of the reasons he said he quit was not so that because Google was censoring what he was saying. People don't attribute what he's saying to Google. And I'll send you a link. Actually, he did an interview. He did many, many interviews. And I actually listened to his interviews at different news outlets. But the best one I found was, for me, was this interview he did with the MIT Technology Review magazine in a conference setting, but he came in via video. There's several things that are they're going on. There's something called back propagation, which which is what's creating this rapid learning in the machine. And because the ability to learn is so high, a human brain has about a hundred trillion neurological connections or neurons. The best machines we have today have about a trillion and nodes and elements. They're learning certain things really, really quickly and better than we are because they're able to learn faster, potentially using this thing called back propagation, which is there's several researchers, including Hinton came up with in the 70s, 
So that's one thing. It can learn very fast. The second thing is, imagine two humans. You learn a bunch of things. I've learned a bunch of things. Now, your job is to teach me what you've learned. If it took you 10 years to learn something, it might take you five minutes to explain to me. And I'm doing an extreme example, right? And then similarly, vice versa. But it'll be an imperfect, leaky process. And then there's a limit as to how many humans you can reach and then teach them everything you know. So knowledge will always be like fragmented. The human intelligence was always fragmented, right? There was no way for one human to teach every other human everything that was in his brain. That's not the limit in AI. Every brain, every AI brain, whatever it learns, it can instantly share with every other AI brain. So this is the capability. Of course, this can have very, you know, many, many positive uses. One of them is that, for example, which I'm really excited about, is that every kid and every person can have an individual tutor now. You know, that student to teacher ratio, just content purposes, it's one on one. So I think that could be very positive. But the one thing that isn't there yet, but they think that it will be, and that's going to be the really scary factor, which is can the machine create goals for itself, right? That's when you have Terminator and runaway machines. Then there are those people, Elon and Gates and others signed that proclamation or whatever it was, they say, well, let's put a pause on AI, which is not realistic. So they don't really mean that, I think. What they mean is that they're trying to create track attention to the problem so that hopefully the policymakers of the world can maybe do something, right? So Jeff Hinton, one of the things he mentions is that think of this as analogous to nuclear weapons or international law on war crimes, these global issues or frameworks that came into being. And so people started cooperating, right? So the nuclear nonproliferation the globe cooperated, right? Because it was a common enemy. United Nations, which gave, for better or for worse, some means of governance at the global level, right? And then you have the monetary stuff, IMF and World Bank and so on. But it was because those were set up to tackle issues that cross all the borders, at least in theory, even if they're very, very imperfect institutions. So we have something similar. He's saying that we're facing, and then a lot of people are saying, the threat is massive. And so the cooperation that's needed is going to need to be global, obviously. So that's just geographically, but it also has to be global from, in the sense it has to be at, from every domain and then every sector, whether nonprofit, for profit, governmental, and on you go. So this is going to affect you. We can pretend if I'm a person in XYZ domain, I can pretend to keep my head in the sand. It's not going to work. It's an interesting, very, very interesting time to be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the good sides are really fun, right? You know, you're typing along in Outlook now, now and it starts to finish your sentence for you. And sometimes that's, you know, exactly what you're going to say. And you, hit tab and you can type twice as fast. The flip side scares me about the, the capability to be deceptive now is going to be much more enhanced. And I don't know where that goes. Nobody, unfortunately, nobody does. And concepts that we've taken for granted for a long time or concepts that we thought were black or white or at least more black or white are much less so. Privacy, copyright, semantics, right? Learning, intelligence, sentience, all these words have been thrown around for a long time, but we weren't forced to think about the deeper meaning of those. No, because we kind of all have had a much higher level of control than is place with what we're doing today. This particular rendition of technology has more life in it independently than we have had in our past. I mean, always before, we talked about an ERP system, right? The ERP system did what you told it to do. There's no magic in software. If you tell it the right stuff, it does the right stuff. If you tell it the wrong stuff, it does the wrong stuff. But it was always you or I who set that up right and controlled it. This feels like it's got a little bit more of a, you know, you point it in a direction and say, got it, I'm on it, I'm out of here, go take a nap and I'll handle it from here. It's definitely, we're going to have much less control than we think. If our expectations are so low, right, or so negative, if you will, maybe hopefully we can be surprised on the positive side. So it's not going to be as bad as we think. Well, the positive side that I'm excited about, right, it is good. I mean, I see, I see the benefits of that really nice. I mean, you know, you can find things, information that didn't, you had a difficult time unearthing before. It's not a problem now. That's a fantastic thing. But there's a lot of upside. I'm excited about that, and I'm not worried about that. I'm just worried about, about the downside pieces of it. I think another thing, I think that may be creating more pessimism also about this or more fear 
is that until the machines were just threatening muscle, but not truly our brains or people who are knowledge workers, what happened was there was a, a little bit of a distance, a degree of separation. The people who have the microphones and now the cameras like you and me, we used to talk about displacement of manufacturing labor or manual labor in a third person sense. Now this, you're talking about displacement in a first person reference. And so that means the people with microphones are amplifying the fear because they're like, this is coming after me. It's not just coming after my cousin and my you know, sister or my friend who's working in the mines or who's working in manufacturing plants in the Midwest or Inland Empire like Spokane. This is coming after me. And so now I'm going to freak out more personally, but I'm also going to say it more on, with the microphone, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, so there's this, I think there's a slight coincidental ap amplification going on. This is going to change things for sure. And one of the things I was talking with an executive who happens to be a friend and he, he happens to be at Starbucks yesterday because his kid is looking at colleges. So one of the things we were talking about was programming computer science software engineering. Should I even bother going into that? If I don't bother, what do I bother with? <laughs> I think that is one of the most, I mean, I said this a long time ago when I was probably back in the early 2000s, I had a bunch of sysadmin type people and I said, man, you got to up your game because we got cloud is coming and we're not going to be sitting on a stack of servers in our computer room. If that's your stated goal in life is to be a sysadmin for a private company. You better think that one over again. Well, it's kind of the same thing now if for the computer programmer because the dang things are writing code faster and better than, than a human can. And you and I being the techies that we've been all our lives, you know, you understand that the term technical debt, if an AI program is good, it's not going to write technical debt, you know, because it's got that ability to have the, the snaps and synaptic connections. It knows, you know, that if I, if I write this here, it's got to tie to that there. And you don't have these disconnects that happen when, you know, when a team of humans are writing it, as good as they might be, they're still going to forget about what Bob did on the other side of the room in his section of the code. So it's been uh, wonderful. And we can continue after we pause the, the recording here. But any final thoughts? You know, it, we talked about some of the craziness in the end. I, I still come back to the, the people matter the most. And no matter what goes on in, in all of these things that we're talking about, if that focus remains for you, for us, we will, generally speaking, make the right decisions, do the right things. If we take our eyes off of that and focus on other things, you, you lose that. And so people matter. That's what we got to focus on. With that happy thought. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Good talking to you. Absolutely. As always. Thank you. Thanks for the Talk invite. You.